turn to, let's, let's go ahead and start with Matthew 24. Go ahead and turn there. Matthew 24. Jesus came out from the temple, was going away with his disciples, came up to point out the temple buildings to him. He said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us. Okay, everybody stop. I want to talk to you. You obviously can't haul these books along. You can't haul the Davises along in your normal life. You know, hey, who are the two old people? Who's the old guy that's in the wheelchair? Who's the old guy in the hospital gurney you keep bringing around? Hey, he's, if I get into an argument about, about the end times, Davis rises up out of there covered with a white sheet. Repent! And everybody does. Um, uh, no, you can't, you, can't, you can't do that. And you can't go, look, Arrhenius said this, and the Greek is really bad, and it's not going to work. You understand what I'm saying? The, you can't haul the external evidence that we can give you to help you go, oh, yeah, I see now. You can't haul it around with you. You can, I guess, but, you know, you, you look pretty silly with that many books. and Maybe you can get them on your phone. But I don't know. I don't know if those are or not. So, what do you have to have? If somebody says, hey, what if, well, you know, and you, you, you walk into Sunday school class and, and they're up there, <clears throat> you, you, you get home and um, your parents haul you off to church and they sit down and, and Sunday school class is talking about revelation and they take off and <clears throat> or they're talking about Matthew 24, and they take off. You've got to have questions. You, again, you're not going to convince anybody. You're not going to convince. Don't try it. Please, don't try it. You've got to get used to this. Who was I talking to the other day? Remember who it was? It might have been somebody here, but I thought it was on the phone. And they, they, they said, maybe it was you, Joe. I think it was, that they were saying things and they were just planting seeds of doubt. Was that you? No. Okay. Uh, another phone call. Yeah. He's a good man. <laughs> planting seeds of doubt. Planting seeds of doubt. I'm telling you, folks, these people, the, the seeds of doubt took a while to get into me as far as, as this stuff. But when they start bringing these things up, Here's where you go. You, excuse me, because I'm telling you, they're going to they're gonna look at... Um, <clears throat> uh, they'll be saying, yeah, here we go. Uh, verse 17, who is on the housetop must go down. Who is the field? Woe to those who are praying. No, what, do you say? what am I looking for? Where is the one? Um, one will be taken, isn't it, in 24? There. there will be two men in the field. And boy, here we go. What's that? Well, that's obviously the, the, the rapture. No, it's not obviously the rapture. It's what you've made it. You've had to say. It's, and we look at it and go, I mean, oh, remember back in the 70s, there was this song. You remember it? I wish we'd all been ready. Some of you are laughing like you've heard it before. Um, you've been left behind. Two, two at a mill, one grinding, one left behind. Anyway, I can't remember whole, all the words, which is wonderful. Um, since, since when is this? Well, I'm telling you, it's not. But you can't just... You know, people, pe people are coming up and they are going, we are taking our assumptions and they are plastering the, test, the text with it. Well, it's a prophetic. 
And uh, Jesus was talking to, to them. But he was also talking to those in the future. Why? Stand up there in front of them and say, why? Why do you think that? Where do you get that this is talking about things in the future? Where? I know you're sitting there going, I'm not going to yell like that, but that would be fun. Stop it. Stop it. Look at verse 3. They come up to Jesus. This is, a, this is the Son of Man, the Son of God. Tell us. One, you, you've already marked it really big in your, Bible, in your, your computer. You need to mark it in your Bible. What, when will these things happen? One. What will be the sign of your coming? Two. And the end of the age. The world. So using the King James. You better be ready with that one too. At least be ready with that part of it. Excuse me, the word there is aeon. Aeon. It's the word for age. It is never, ever, ever, ever used as the word world. The word world in the Greek is what? Come on. Cosmos. Everybody. Louder. Uh, that's, um, you've, got, you've got to have that down. The word here is aeon. It's age, end of the age. Now, there are different ages that we see, you know, going around, you know, here in the earth, whatever. It doesn't mean God's changing like the dispensationalists say. But where is the internal evidence that Matthew 24 was not written to us? It's there in verse 3. The disciples come to him and they said, Tell us. And the three questions are one, two, three. Boom, boom. When? What's the signs? When's the end of the age? There you are. This is internal evidence that this was written to, that Jesus was talking to the disciples about something specifically had said. What did he say? Verse 2. I'm telling you, I'm telling you folks, I'm, I'm yelling at not one stone is going to be left upon another. Not one stone. This is what's going to happen. Well, when's this going to happen? What are you talking about? And so, what we have to do, <coughs> by the way, the assumption that this is about the future, if, if this is about the future, also, get ready for this one, verse 2 is one of the ones they will tell you is the reason that there's got to be a new temple built. Now stop a second, you're hurting me already. What's the problem? You made an assumption. The assumption is that this is about the future. And this is not about the future. This is about a thing called 70 AD. Ever heard of it? You ever heard of Titus? You ever heard of Vespasian? Was this a prophecy? Very much. Very precise. But it was to them, not to us. Yes, sir. I just remember I had no idea whenever you brought up Titus that in my first few semesters, it was always so confusing. How many times did I say it? Go on, go on. You said it so many times, but the only two Tituses I knew was the Titus in the Bible and Titus Wong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but Titus Wong, you know, well, I, well, I would pick on him too because I think he came during that time. Yeah, so. <laughs> go, Titus. Titus destroyed Jerusalem. I'm like, <laughs> I, I'll go read Titus and I'm like, I, I'll see it. I'll see it. <laughs> okay, Titus, folks. You guys can all laugh. But. Yeah. <laughs> You guys all knew it. Right? Oh, it was it was it was it was so new to everybody, and it was so amazing. I'm telling you, watch the faces, just this stunned silence. But I'm sorry, you see, for us to make this chapter in the future, we have got to add a lot to the text. We have got to say. They said one thing, Jesus said another. That's the first thing we have to do. 
We also have to take the evidence. Now, the external evidence is that, <clears throat> and you can find this in, the, in the, the, these books. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 5. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. External evidence showed that that happened. After Jesus, all sorts of, this is the enemy's way. What happened with Moses? Moses walks up, throws down a stick. What, are the, what does the disciples of the enemy do? They walk down and they throw, up, throw down a stick. Turns into, hey, yeah, look, this is the way it works. So Jesus comes and Satan goes, we can confuse him. We'll send a, a fake Messiah. We'll send a bunch of fake messiahs. And they did. <clears throat> You'll be hearing wars or rumors of wars. That's external evidence. Now it's, it's there. I promise you it's in these books. See that you're not frightened. These things must take place, that not the end. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Hmm. Various places, famines and earthquakes. Again, external evidence. This is all historical. This is historical to us. It was future to them. Okay? All these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. They will deliver you to tribulation. Not the great tribulation, but just tribulation. And will kill you. You will be hated by all people's tongues because of my name. Because of my name. That time many will fall away, betray one another. This is what happened. And the days were pretty bad. Verse 23. If anyone says to you, here's the Christ. There he is, do not believe him. False Christ, false prophets will arise. Show great signs and wonders. Told you in advance. Um, Paul was fighting against this. We see him uh, saying, you now some people are saying that I've told you the resurrection has happened. Why would they say the resurrection had happened? Why would, why would believers believe such a thing? I promise you, because there were those, there were those that were saying, uh, I'm the Christ. I'm the Christ risen from the dead. I'll bet you, I'll bet you. In fact, I shouldn't say that, but, but it's true. That's what they were doing. I am, I am he. Now, um, we just got into something. Well, no, we're, we're, we're going to come back to this. Now, the reason that I wanted to look at this is just so that you will see that in chapter 24. Now, let's, let's go to um, Mark. Where is it in Mark. 13. Because these people will wiggle around all over the place. Uh, verse 4. Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of all these things are going to be fulfilled? Okay? He is looking at something very specific. They are asking him, Mark's account is a little different. Uh, but still, what will be the sign? When will all these things... Okay, what did, how did Matthew put it? What will be the sign of your coming? Mark says, what will be the sign? And if we put a comma right there, what will be the sign, comma? When, will all these things going to, when are all these things going to be fulfilled? You see, there could have been. So it's, this is not some... Okay, it's that different. This is still... The internal evidence that this is what he's talking about. Luke 21, 7. He again says the same thing. They say, teacher, when will these things happen? What will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he goes through the same thing. The internal evidence is that Yeshua, our Lord, is talking to his disciples. He is talking to his disciples very specifically about something. And he has said, these stones are all going to be torn down. Now, nobody can believe this. When is this going to happen? Now, they did believe him. Woo! But this is stunning. When is this going to happen? They're hoping it's going to be way off in the future. And he starts telling them what? Things they would need to know. Now, some of them were going to be dead. Nero killed some before 70 A.D. 
Nero killed Peter. Nero killed Paul, who was not there, of course, but he killed others. And uh, again, I just simply wanted to point out the external evidence is in all three of those chapters telling us something. Turn to the book of Revelation, please. By the way, I was reading one of the books this morning where this person had amassed uh, a lot of evidence about the fact that before last century, it was the last century, during the 20th century, before last century, very few people, very few commentators, and the biggest names um, all believed Revelation had an early date of writing rather than a later date. Again, I remind you, what does it matter? Who cares? It matters greatly. It matters greatly. If it has a late date, in other words, after the, the fall of Jerusalem, anyway, if it was after then we have to then we look at the book of revelation as something in our future even and we can go well it happened somewhere in those 2000 years no you you start reading it and you're going well that's this stuff hadn't all happened at once and that's why these people come up by the way i found my copy of the late great planet earth we'll be reading it uh, one chapter at a time here at lunch well never mind um, but i did find it and we'll maybe take a look at it uh, still being put out there. It's unreal. He's still out there doing his stuff. Uh, and it doesn't matter how many times he's proven himself wrong. Well, it's going to happen here. It's going to happen now. It's going to this. This is. Oh, we're, we're right there. We're right. We're right there. Right there. From the time he started saying this, we're 40 or 50 years past the right there. And he was saying 50 years ago, we, it's right on top of us. Um, and anyway, who knows what the future is. But there's to, to take these things, and it's amazing. What they do is they pluck out little things here. We've already talked about that. We could do a study of the Antichrist in a half an hour. And you would understand what the Antichrist was. But when they do a study of the Antichrist, because they have to also talk about the beast and the, the second beast and the this and that and all of this other stuff and pull out things and they, they have to... It, the word Antichrist is never there. What do they have to do? They have to superimpose something over the text that it did not say. Superimpose. Superimpose. Say it. Superimpose. They are superimposing something over the text that was not said. You're not going to be able to win all the battles, but you can get some people thinking. The purpose of this is to set folks free. The purpose of this is that we that are in His kingdom begin to walk in His kingdom. Do you understand? I don't think we do, but we don't. Why, why do you lack faith? Come on. Why do you lack faith? Now don't tell me. We already know. The reason that you lack faith is because you don't have God's Word in you. Come on. I mean, that's, that's reality. After coming here, and you wind up being kind of thrown into this, and we make the Word get inside you, the way that you view things changes. We're brainwashing you. Now, I know you, we're, we're not, but you know, maybe God is, but we're not. You see things different because the Word's getting inside you. We lack faith, and when we lack faith, everybody hear me. 
you don't walk as if the king lives inside you. You don't believe in prayer. You don't believe in answered prayer. You don't see any reason for you living a holy life and not just going off and doing what the world does because you're going to heaven anyway. You were once saved, always saved. There's no reason to, to go to God in prayer. There's no reason to seek His face. Big deal. Let's go live like the world. And that's what we do. Because we don't have His Word living inside us, just as Jesus said. The purpose of the talk about Revelation, the purpose of the talk about Matthew 24, is to let you know something. The book of Revelation is letting you know God's in charge and He's won the victory. Won the victory. And that all of this stuff that they're going one of these days, one of these days, one of these days is Satan. One of these days. There was a song about that too. You remember that one? One of these days, one of these days. One of these days. That was it. It was really a brilliant song. Uh, Troubles will soon be o'er. Happy forevermore. There, how about that, huh? One of these days, I'm going home. One of these days. One of these days. Look, that is why, because all you can do if you're talking to people is plant seeds of doubt. Maybe they'll go and find out. Maybe they will come to you and say, you need to tell me more about this. I've been suspecting it. This is what happens with us all the time. Is people go, oh, oh. You know I, mean? They'll be, I mean, literally this happens. It, it, it used to happen here quite often, but it doesn't happen as much as it, because people kind of get used to it. But when we go and speak places, people will suddenly, you'll see the look on their face and sometimes they can't hold it back. It's not the Davis's brilliant teaching. It's the Holy Spirit just told him something that he'd already been telling them, been whispering it to them. We come along and go, guess what? And they just scream, oh, guess what? That's true. Now, all of that to again, now let's get to what is the external evidence, or not external, the internal evidence. We're not looking at external. One of the biggest points of the internal evidence of the date of the book of Revelation. And that is hiding in plain sight. That's, that's good. One would think. Let's look at 1-1. One, one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon, shortly, take place. That is, that is internal evidence. And when they start telling you one day, is a th this is... This is God communicating to people. When God is communicating one year, one day is a thousand years, He's communicating to people. But He is not trying to tell them something specific. What we are speaking of there, where is that scripture? Is, is that it, Second Peter? But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's not a psalm. Now, Psalm 94. What's Psalm 90, verse 4 say? For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday and then it passes by. All right. So, it was a psalm. But the specific one is in is Peter. Um The time is near. Yeah. There's, there's all sorts of places in the book of Revelation that it says the time is near. It's upon, it's, it's et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, um, 
So keep that in mind for when they, they're quoting that. What it is speaking about in that particular verse is the grandeur of God and the fact that, get ready for this one. Okay, everybody, please everybody, please look up at me and listen. God is eternal. You don't have to thank me. You don't have to leave money. It's okay. It's free. That's what he's talking about. Time doesn't mean anything to God. But, Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to do what? To show, to show, to show, to show. To his bondservants, the thing which must take place must, well, soon. What would you call soon? Come on, everybody, what's, what's, what's soon? What? <coughs> Soon. See, that's as good as you can do. Well, soon. Oh, we'll do that soon. Can mean days from now. Um, it, it, it could mean that day. You tell it to a three-year-old you were stupid uh, because it meant now. Um, you know, you, it, soon. It's God talking to people. Soon. Soon. No matter what, you ain't going to get 2,000 years out of soon. That's, that's the first point of it. To show to his bondservants. It looks like it's nothing being said, but it's, it's, some, it's expressly saying, I'm talking to my bondservants and I'm telling them the things that must soon take place. And he sent and communicated by his angel to his bondservant John who testified to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even all that he saw. Three, blessed is he who reads, those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it. What? The time is near. It never takes too long. We've already hit three internal evidences of the fact that Revelation was written at an early date and that this is talking about and will talk about the fall of Jerusalem. But now we come to verse 4 and look what we see. Who was the book of Revelation written to? Hal Lindsey? Sorry. It wasn't written to me. It doesn't mean, that does not mean that we cannot get some things out of it. But it was written to who, Mrs. Davis? The seven, the seven churches. The seven churches that are in Asia. It's not written to us. Now, it, I understand the things that were written before are, are for our benefit. But if it's written for out in the future, that ain't much benefit. If it's written back in the past... It is for our benefit. But the point right here is that we've seen three evidences of early date. And now we come up to another one that's written to the seven churches that are in Asia. And there is the only way that you can turn Revelation into a book that's way out into the future is when you are superimposing something over the text. You are superimposing something over the text. He's talking to these churches... He's not talking to them 50 years from now. All of these churches are gone. All of them. They're all gone. They're, it's, it's, they're, well, 2,000 years later, they're not... Excuse me. You want another evidence? He's talking to these churches, and 2,000 years from the time of this writing, they're not there anymore. Soon, must take place soon, it, it goes on and on, and he's talking to churches, but he's talking to them 2,000 years from now, but they're not there. These churches were gone, when were they gone? I can't remember, it's been a long time since I looked at the dates on it. 
Now I know you look at verse 7. He's coming with clouds, every eye will see him. <clears throat> but look, every eye what? Specifically, he says every eye will see him, but then specifically what? Even those who pierced him and all the who? The word, what's, what's the word in NAS? What's, anybody have a King James? No, you don't, you don't need, yeah, but, but the word is tribes. The word is tribes. We'll, talk, we'll look at it later on, but the, but the word tribe in the Bible pretty much exclusively, if not exclusively, always means, unless you change it to something else, Israel. Why? They were tribes. It was, it was tribes, the tribes, and that's what they meant, the tribes. Okay? All right. Questions or comments so far? I want to go back to another word and just look. Yes, sir. There are seven churches in seven ages. I can't forget that. Now, Mr. Miller has pointed out something that you're going to hear. Yeah. They, they, they come up, they're having to stop a second superimpose something on the text. This is no different, this is no different than going back to, um, and you hear people doing this, theologians do this, this has been done. Um, in the beginning, God, and the evening and the morning were the first day. What's that? Yeah, a thousand years, millions of years actually. It was the Precambrian period where just the sun was out there. Yeah, thousands was millions. That's right. Billions of years now we're getting into this. And away we go. Do you understand? They're superimposing something on the text. But they will say that was an age. And then the next day was another age. It's unbelievable to listen to these people say this stuff, flapping in the wind and twisting all over the place and saying absolutely nothing. They're superimposing things on the text. Let the text say what it's saying. That is probably the number one law in exegetical commentary there. Sound pretty good? They're going to, they're going to say what Tyler said. They're going to. You better be ready. And where do you see that? All you have to ask the question. Where do you see that? Show me. Well, it's pretty clear. Excuse me. You, you, you look, okay, you go back and you read. Okay, let's, let's go look at it real quick. <clears throat> okay, chapter 1 is, he's, he's looking upon the risen Christ and, and a lot of other things going on. And chapter 2, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, Seven gold lamps said, said, I know your deeds, your toil and your perseverance. You cannot tolerate evil men. Put to test, call themselves apostles or not. You have found them to be false. You have perseverance and endured for my name. This is the early church. Okay, just so you all understand, this is the early church. Or maybe this is the early, what do they call them? Patriarchs. <clears throat> But we'll call it the early church since the Nicolaitans are in it. But now just a second. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. You cannot tolerate evil men. You put to test those who call themselves apostles. That is not the early church. That's us. We're doing that. Well, how can you say that? I said it just with just as much authority. Please hear me. Okay, we'll go ahead and play. Tyler. Tyler is, is where, and he says, these are ages. And I begin to read this, and I say, this is actually us right now. This is not, this is not the early church. Tyler says, how do you say that? I can say it with as much authority as you said it. Why? You have no proof. This is what the text says 
to this specific church, not to this specific age. And I can make up everything I want to make up about it just as easily. Well, the Nicolaitans, excuse me, the Nicolaitans are already here. Ms. Davis, tell them. What? What does Nicolaitan mean? Never mind, Davis. Ms. Davis doesn't remember. She, she's talked about it before. Um, the, the word uh, Nicholas, wasn't it? Nicolaitan? Remember? It, it meant. What? I don't know, but I don't have my phone here to look it up. Don't have the phone here to look it up. What? Yeah, we won't, we won't, we won't try it then. Never mind. Uh, we'll get back and we'll talk about the Nicolaitans in a little bit because you need to, we need to understand this. But the Nicolaitans, nobody knows really who they were. <clears throat> nobody knows. We have evidence, evidences, and I think some pretty good ones, that indicates who they were. But either way, they, the fact is that they can say, well, they were only back here. Really? What were they? Now, I can, if I give you the evidence of what, where we think they are and what we think they are, I've got to go and find that. Um, you can see that, that we have just as might, much right to superimpose things over the text as they did. You go to the second uh, church, the last and the first. I know your tribulation and your poverty. Blasphemy of who they say is the Jews, but they're not. Synagogue of Satan. Can we not plaster that over today's church? Do you not fear that you're about to suffer? Behold, can't somebody come along and preach... Brethren, do not, do not fear. The devil's about to cast some of you into prison. Et cetera, et cetera. Folks, you can use your imagination to do anything with this text. But you're not supposed to do that. Why? Um, Revelation chapter 22 18, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book, the prophecy, God will take away his part in the tree of life. It seems like there's a warning about being careful with how you're handling this. Either way, we, what we have seen is that There is a lot of evidence for an early date in the text already. Now, Sam? Yeah, I was just wondering, don't we at a certain point have to add something to the text? Because it is a book of prophetic symbols, and at a certain point we are interpreting it with yeah. things that aren't in the text. And you do see things like that, and that's true. But you're not adding to the text. That's not superimposing something. Um, if I told you, uh, Sam, I, I'm really good at remembering jokes. Man, I've got a million of them. Would you think that I knew a million jokes? Or would you think, okay, he knows a lot of jokes. Okay? Uh, that's not superimposing something on it. If I said... Sam, I know a lot of jokes. I have a million of them. And you said, Dr. Davis said in this statement that he is a professor of anthropology and knows all there is about humankind. How can you say that? Because mankind, we all know, is nothing but a joke. And so, therefore, he is, that's, that is superimposing something on the text. Imposing is a good word to do it. You're, it's an imposition. It's imposing. But you're super, super over. You're over imposing. You're not looking at the text and going, this is what the symbols were and what they're saying. You are saying the text says something that it's not saying. Okay? So it's, uh, yeah, 
there are interpretations, and I can understand that we, because they go, well, it's all a matter of interpretation. This is something else they're going to say. Well, it's a matter of your interpretation. Excuse me. But I'm telling you what, when you have somebody say that, well, you know, it's just a matter of interpretation. Ask them a question. Do me a favor, please. Ask them a question. It's me personally you're doing a favor. Look at them and go, so what's your interpretation? Have you looked at this to interpret it? In any way at all? It's always amazing. The, the, the people that I know in my life that have said that, I, can, I think I can pretty much truthfully say none of them ever picked up a Bible. Never did. This, the Word of God has been proven over and over in so many ways to be something a little bit different than a normal book. And there are those that are resistant of it, those that don't want the first thing to do with it. Okay, that's who they are. But don't let them get away with, well, it's all open to interpretation when they have never interpreted. I told you the story about my buddy that came up to me and said something about the prophecies in the Bible not being true and the Bible itself not being true. And he didn't believe that. And I said, if I gave you a book to read, would you read it? He said, I would. So I gave him, that's terribly dull, but he said he would read it. I gave him a copy of Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you've ever picked up Evidence That Demands a Verdict, we are talking, it's drier than eating dust out in the Sahara Desert. It's just full of a lot of incredible, incredible information. I mean, it's one, McDowell is, is, he is proving his point over and over and over, page after page after, of all of this stuff. This fellow came back to me and he said, well, I finished your book. I said, wow, okay, great, you read it. He said, I did. He said, I've, I've, I said, well, what, what did you think? He said, I found it interesting. Here's this guy claiming he's, he's a person of faith and he's giving all these evidences for the Bible. <laughs> I said, what? The conversation started out with and you were complaining that the Bible has no evidence of being the Word of God. And this guy has amassed, that's why he's called the book that, evidence that demands a verdict. When he finished reading it, again, what was his, his complaint? There is no evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. I gave him a book where the guy amassed a complete book of here are the evidences that this book is different than any other book. And when he finished it, he said, the guy was given all this, this concrete information about it. He, he wasn't talking about faith. Going back in exactly the opposite direction. Do you hear what happened? Okay. Now, I don't know if this guy ever, as far as I know, he never came to, to belief in the Lord. Maybe he's, you know, going to get there. I have no idea. But he um, was doing what most people do. They, they, here's my complaint. When you begin to answer that complaint, they change subjects. You watch how people change the subject real quick. And that's what he did. Changes the... But don't, this, is, this is where the... Uh, one of our problems in, in uh, argument, by that I don't mean arguing, but argument, logical uh, statements and logical talking. You can't have that kind of, of argument much anymore. People are so doing these things in, uh, on an emotional level. Either way, uh, Ms. Davis, you look like you got... Uh, it's the natural man, and I, the Lord brings this to mind. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised and 
all the arguing and stuff isn't going to make someone believe. Yeah. It is, it's the work of the Spirit. This is the work of God that you believe. Uh, and it's God's, you know, we talk about prayer a lot. It's prayer. Um, it's God working as we're abiding. It doesn't mean that just because I tell them truth, that they're going to believe. If God's speaking through me, it doesn't mean that the outcome is going to be they're going to become a believer. It's just um, all scripture is profitable. If, if, yes, these were written at a certain time, but it says all scripture is profitable, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. All scripture. And it's all inspired by God. And... Um, it's prop, um, and I just was thinking, Satan keeps revelation as, you know, off in the future that someday we will reign and as, you know, and all of that when we get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And that yes. is, you know, That's a lie. Stop, but stop, it's, stop right there. Mm -hmm. You need to say that really loud. He keeps it off in the future so that one day we will reign. So That's obviously a That's, That's a lie. lie. And that we need to know that. Uh, That's what the whole point. But it's the whole thing is it's God breathes it's his word it's breathe God breathe this is Davis brought up something very important but there I want to I want to talk about that what she's what she's saying she said if all the Bible is is a history book then you you're gonna get anything out of it this this is dumb <laughs> this is really dumb um, now but wait a second but we're talking about the Bible being a history book, aren't we? I mean, that's what we're talking about. But no, it's not. What we're talking about is there's a big difference between the Bible being accurate and talking about history and taking the Bible and saying that it says something about the future that it's not saying. It does not matter where you open in the Bible. And, and I've got to tell you, I have found in almost every section, somewhere, something that God would speak to me personally. See, it's a personal thing. And there's a difference between, oh, it's just a history book. Oh, it's a prophecy book. Oh, it is a book that speaks to people generation after generation after generation and in a specific personal way that the books don't talk about. Something about it. It's God breathed. And so when she's, when, when all you do is, we're not telling you, okay, you just get to read the book of Revelation as a history book. I think it is, but it's not. Um, it is a book that can speak to you today. But it's talking mostly about things in the past, before the destruction of Jerusalem. So, anyway, please understand, the book is alive. But just because it's living doesn't mean, I mean, we don't sit there and look at the book of Amos and go, well, that's talking about the future. Everybody would, well, of course not. That's not talking about that. Um, oh, this, this part of this book is talking about the future. Ecclesiastes, got to be talking about the future. That would be a fun one. No, this, I, bet we, I bet we could come up with, I bet we could open up to a big Ecclesiastes and we could come up with something that it's talking about the future. I mean, doesn't Solomon, I think, he says in it, it's there in Proverbs where he says, is there not a future? Aha! See? There we go. And so we can, the next late great planet Earth, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. This is about the kingdom of heaven in us. But what about the end? What about the end? I don't know. Neither do you. In fact, neither does the sun. Boy, nobody wants to hear that. Anyway. Uh, anybody else on, on these things we've talked about this morning? So far. Yes. 
just kind of a couple of different things just on the, the Bible being history. It is, but if we say it's only history, that's, we can't just be, we can't put the Bible, we can't put God in a box. But the amazing thing is that history repeats itself and God wants to speak to us through what has happened in the past so that we can learn how to abide and live in Him today. That's correct. Because if it happened with the Amorites and their iniquity being complete, and Jerusalem and the Jews and their iniquity coming to a, a place of completion, will not our generation, if we continue in wickedness, them. come to a place of being complete? And can we not learn to to repent <laughs> and to turn away from our wickedness and seek the face of God so that we won't be destroyed. But if we just say, oh, it's just history and it, and it doesn't affect us today, then what's the point of reading it besides just knowing about history? So that was one thing. But then also Mrs. D brought up about if Revelation is all about the future, then we we don't realize that we are called to live and reign in this life. And one stipulation for ruling and reigning is in 2 Timothy 12. He says, if we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. And that's, are we, we don't want, we don't ever rule because we don't ever want to suffer. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to make a statement and we'll start drawing this to a close. But the statement is we look back, I think, with a somewhat amount of disdain, disgust at the Jews. What's wrong with those people? <clears throat> their civilization, their nation. Uh, when did David start ruling? 500 B.C., around in there, something like that. It's been a long time. So we'll talk at 500 B.C. And that nation lasted for 500 years, you know, as, as a nation. Um, maybe 600, maybe a little longer. And the, the people in it, would have looked back at the time of Moses and gone, gone just like we do. I don't see God doing that. I don't think it's true. We've been given something greater than Moses. Jesus said so. It's true. And we look at them and you know, why didn't they rule and reign? I want you to stop a second and think about it. We are, have been trained to look to the future We've been trained one of these days. We've been trained when we get to heaven. We've been trained. But I'm going to tell you something. We have been given something greater than Moses. For the last 2,000 years, mankind has had something greater than Moses. You, I, have something greater than Moses. We have been given the privilege through the power of God to rule and reign over self. That's the first place. Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the living God living inside you via His blood covenant gives you power over self. I don't have to go along with whatever it is I say. Whatever it is I think, I don't have to do that. I could stop before I say something. I could stop before I do something. I could consider. It happened to me this morning. It was a very minor thing. Um, and the Lord just grabbed me and said, Do you see how what you were about to say and the way you were going to say it. It wasn't, it wasn't fighting words or anything like that, but it was 
um, the attitude in it was one of self-ishness, okay, just so I'm grammatically correct, but was one of self-ishness. Ishness is another word for me. It's teasing. Um, I guess it is. Selfish, and that's what it is. It's about me. And he stopped me. He said, don't do it that way. Do it like this. And he guided me through it, and I, I thought, hmm. <laughs> what happened? Self didn't get to rule. That's the first place we're supposed to be ruling. And I'll tell you the other place, the next place we're supposed to be ruling on this earth. And yesterday, we stopped and we prayed. There were people all over this country in different areas praying. And I've got to tell you, when I was praying, it wasn't so much that everybody else was praying along, but it was it was stepping into an understanding I've got a duty to do here. Please pardon what I'm saying and I think you'll understand when I say what I'm saying that I'm not saying what you think I'm saying. You, think you, you didn't think I could get that out but I, I got it. it. <laughs> I have a duty when I was praying, I thought, I, it, I've got a duty to do here. And by God, I'm going to do it. Now, do you understand what I just said? Somebody's saying, by God, normally, or you're like, I'm not going to put up with that. No, you don't understand. By God, I'm going to do it. Mom, get me out of here. I'm telling you, he's using God's name in vain. No, I didn't. I am swearing by his power, not by mine, and not by my might. But that when I prayed yesterday, when I prayed today, by God, I mean it. Do you understand what I just said? Some fool heathen going, well, my God. I love Tim Tebow's thing on, you know, somebody would swear in the locker room, Jesus Christ. Devo's comment when he would yell out, loves you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, an old, old, old funny paper cartoon, very famous. Um, the, he made a, he did a whole thing on God is dead. And it was real. it was very funny. It was, uh, it was uh, really just uh, not too long after Nietzsche was alive doing his thing. And, uh, and this guy did this whole run through the comics on, on God is Dead. And one of the comments from one of the characters was, you know, the, the, the whole thing was this, a theologian, and this is typical, theologian who was a little uh, bird, I think a rooster of some sort, not a surprise, not a surprise, little bandy rooster. An acorn fell out of a tree onto his head. And he looked at it and went, it's God, he's fallen out of heaven, he's dead. And that's where it started. So the theologian is running around everywhere telling everybody, yeah, God is dead. And he's running around and he, he's telling it to different people. And he says, you know, God is dead. And one of the, one of the protagonists, in fact, he's a protagonist through all of these things, said, huh, funny, I was talking to him this morning. He didn't even say he was sick. <laughs> now, that's, that's a good line. That's a good line. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. That's a good line, too. Uh, we are supposed to be ruling and reigning over first self by the power of God. I mean, 
that with, with the strength almost of what God, when he, he drew me up short this morning to keep me from doing something selfish, you know what? Well, by God, that's the way I acted. That sounds terrible. No, it isn't. That's wonderful. <laughs> this is wonderful. How are we supposed to be acting toward this world around us? There are evil people that need to be called to account. That's our job. That's our job. It's your job. Not so that they will crush them, God. That's not what the point is. The point is it's for God's kingdom to go forth. But we keep lying about the kingdom. And I'm going to say this again. The church keeps lying about the kingdom. The church lies about itself. We're the kingdom. They're not. Religion is not the kingdom because it's not the kingship. I think more than any other group the last few years here at IMI, I wouldn't want to be y'all. I'm really serious when I say that. I wouldn't want to be y'all. When I was your age, I was so worldly. You have been called out of the world. You've been set here with two people that God has called specifically to look at a whole lot of people and say, you need to quit that. This is not what the kingdom of heaven is. And that's your job. God has empowered you to rule over you. And in ruling over you, He's called you and empowered you to rule over this earth in a way that few will, but that few can. Let me say that again. You have been called, you have been, you have been called first to rule over yourself, but then when ruling over yourself, you have been called to rule over this world in a way that few can, but you will. You are supposed to be ruling. Most people don't know it. Most people that claim to be believers don't know it. So they won't rule. Why do they not know it? Matthew 24, Revelation. We're waiting to rule. We'll rule someday. The kingdom of heaven is now. We're supposed to be ruling. By God. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be ruling by God. That's the incredible thing. We've been called, this generation has been called to rule in a way. And I'm telling you folks, when you pray, when you pray about this nation, when you pray about these things, you pray believing. 